Colossians chapter 3, we're only going to do two verses. This isn't a normal study because the next time after Good Friday that I come back and do this, uh, we're going to be starting all over with chapter 3, verse 1. So tonight is really an introduction to chapter 3, which is an enormously important and practical chapter. So I'm just going to sort of lay the groundwork, and more than teaching it tonight, I'm going to sort of preach about it. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Let's pray. Father, it always shakes me to my core when we sing that your righteousness is like a mighty mountain. Well, the reality, Lord, is that our righteousness, well, let's just say it's not like a mighty mountain at all. That's why it matters so much that you gave us your righteousness You made a deal, Lord, on the cross in exchange for your filth, in exchange for your sin. I will give you my perfection, my righteousness. And when you died, Lord, and when you didn't stay dead, your righteousness was given to us. And while we may feel a little shaky, the truth is when we're with you, Jesus, we are like that mighty mountain, immovable steadfast. Help us tonight, Lord, to understand the importance of making a decision and sticking to that decision. Tonight, Lord, as we talk about a partnership between our hearts and our minds, we really need your help. Our hearts are in the right place, Lord, but our hearts, our feelings, our emotions are so undependable and you have given us the mind of Christ and may we be steadfast in that mind and may our lives bring you honor and glory I too want to pray along with David that if there's anyone here who doesn't know you that this might be the night that he or she or they would surrender their hearts to you add to your family Lord And may we bring you honor and glory in all that we do. And as we read ahead in this chapter, it's about change. Help us decide to be conformed to your image with every single day. We love you and we're grateful for all that you've done. And now, Lord, bless our time together in your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Partnerships have always been sort of a part of our fabric as a country. Some of you younger guys will have to Google some of these references, but we're familiar with partnerships. I think about growing up, Abbott and Costello. Again, you can Google Martin and Lewis. One without the other would never have mattered, never have really amounted to much. A little closer to home, I think about the partnership between Tim and Tony and Manu and how successful and how consistent they were. I think about the evil empire and the partnership between Shaq and Kobe. (laughs) Evil but successful. I think about Paul Allen and Bill Gates. One without the other, well, they'd still be in a garage trying to figure things out. Partnerships matter. I think about Nike. Phil Knight was a genius. There's a lot about Phil Knight that's not to be admired. But he partnered with Michael Jordan. And they remained steadfast. Later, Phil Knight would partner with Tiger Woods. And even when the whole world was coming against Tiger Woods, Phil Knight stood with him. And the partnership flourished. And of course, Nike did as well. One of my favorite partnerships is bacon and eggs. (laughs) I mean, you can eat bacon alone, but you can't eat eggs alone. But maybe the greatest partnership of all is the one that 
David and the team sang about in the very first song, the lion and the lamb. The lion is fierce and scary. The lamb saves. Partnerships matter, and tonight I have one goal in mind, and that goal is to help you form a partnership between your mind and your heart. The mind is the place of decision, the heart the place of affection. We're here because we're Christians, we love the Lord, but, but our hearts are so fickle, so undependable, I said earlier. But with the mind of Christ, if we can form a partnership, we can be ready for anything, and we can be used by God and for God's glory. Colossians chapter 3, an exceptionally practical and important Bible study. It begins with this, since. Now, if you have a King James, it says if. That's really a bad translation. This is an assumption and not a conclusion. Since all of the things that we've already learned about in the book of Colossians, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts, remember that's the place of affection. The Greek here is in the continuous imperative tense. Keep on setting your heart daily. On things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds. Now, this is a deliberate act of the will. The mind, the place of decision. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Now, I'm going to read to you the Living Bible's translation of this. And it's not a pure translation, but it is so rich. Listen to this. Same two verses, since you became alive again, so to speak, when Christ arose from the dead, now set your sights on the rich treasures and joys of heaven, where he sits beside God in the place of honor and power. Let heaven fill your thoughts. Don't spend your time worrying about things down here. Now that's a mic drop moment. We spend so much time worrying about things down here. And what we have to do is make a once and forever decision that the things down here don't really matter. They don't really apply to us. We get our instructions. We get our inspiration. We get our strength and our power from things above. Because our Jesus is seated at the right hand of the power of God. Just the fact that Jesus is at the right hand, that's the power end of God. And all that power, the power that raised Christ from the dead, lives in each and every one of us. And if we decide to walk with Jesus, then our hearts will follow our minds. We need to form a partnership tonight between our hearts and minds. Now what I mean is this. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Holy Spirit is going to demand that we make changes in the way we live. That's what chapter 3 is really all about. These are not going to be suggestions. These are things, if you're a Christian, you won't do these things. If you're a Christian, you will do these things. And the Holy Spirit is going to demand that we make those changes. And the purpose of those changes has but one goal, and that's to please God with and through our lives. Now, to get established in this partnership, the importance of it. I think tonight we need to agree, our hearts and minds, agreeing on three pretty basic issues. The first thing we need to agree on tonight is we need to agree that God is rightfully in charge of our lives. Now we know that here, don't we? But our hearts, as I said, are so fickle that our hearts get turned one way and then the other way. We need to agree that God is completely in charge of our lives, and rightfully so, 100%. We can't hold a little bit back and think we're okay with the Lord. We have to agree, heart and soul, heart and mind, that He's in charge of our lives. Now, most of us have trouble with that concept because there's always a part of our heart that wants to serve God, but there's also a part of our heart that wants to do what we want to do. And that's where the mind in partnership has to overrule the desires of the heart. 
We have that part of our heart that loves God, but we've got a sin nature. There's also a struggle inside because there's a part of our heart that loves to do stuff that we know we shouldn't be doing. Our hearts are torn because of this struggle. We find ourselves often in the same place that the Apostle Paul found himself in in Romans chapter 7. What I want to do, I don't do. What I don't want to do, that's what I find myself doing. And if we will agree that God is completely in charge, then we won't have to get to the place where Paul says, oh, wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this body of death. We're Christians, and because of that, our hearts want God in charge. We want to please him. But we still have that struggle, that tension between flesh and and spirit because our flesh is always in rebellion. That's why this partnership tonight between what you want and what you know is right, and we get that in our word, in our Bibles, that's why this partnership has to be forged once and for all. The second thing that we need to agree on is that not being obedient to God is sin. You can't hold some stuff back and think you're okay. Your mind has to make this logical conclusion. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. So if I'm not in obedience, Lord, then, well, I'm in sin. I'm in rebellion against you. And if we don't agree on that principle, then nothing that Paul has to say to us in the practical section of Colossians has any value. We have to agree that God alone is the final word regarding what is or is not sin We've got to give God free license, free reign in each of our lives. We can't listen to our culture. We can't listen to our friends or our family. We can't even listen to our own thoughts. It's just Jesus. Second, we have to agree that not being obedient to God is wrong. Third, and this is tricky for some of us. I don't know why, but it really is. We have to understand that God requires our partnership with him. You know, there's a lot of Christians, for one reason or another, and they just believe, well, if God wants me to do something, he'll make me do it. No, God requires our partnership with him. I've had people over the years, well, why won't God do this, or why won't God take this thing from me? Why won't God give me victory over this sin or this temptation? God has already done that. And faith and our word teaches us that if God's already done it, then all we have to do is believe it and walk in it. Well, to walk with Jesus requires partnership. We've got to decide we're going to do what he says. We're going to go where he wants us to go. He wants our cooperation. He doesn't force us to do anything. He doesn't order us to do things. He asks us to pick up our cross and follow him. I think sometimes we think that we can become mature, we can become better Christians simply by knowing stuff. I've had people over the years tell me repeatedly, well, I read the Bible every day. And my response is usually, but but you're not doing what it says. What's the value of knowing something if you don't do it? I would even posit that if you don't do something that you claim you know, you don't really know it at all. And that's sadly the case with a lot of Christians. We'll read the Bible, we'll listen to Bible teaching. I think sometimes we think it'll just rub off on us, but that's not the truth. We must want to be spiritually as opposed to earthly minded people. We've all heard the saying, you can be so spiritually minded that you're no earthly good. Well, it's impossible to be too spiritually minded or too heavenly minded. Because the more heavenly minded you are, the more good, the more value you have on earth. We have to desire to serve God and to serve God's people. That's one of the reasons that he wants us to make changes in our lives. He wants us to clean things up. Because he wants to use you to be a blessing to others. And we can't sort of stand back and say, well, you know, that's their issue, their problems. No, God wants to use us, and we have to have that desire. Now, if we can agree on those basic principles, we have something to build on. As in the rest of this chapter, Paul is going to build a how-to regarding making those changes. 
It's one thing to say, you got to do this, you can't do this. But Colossians chapter 3 is one of the best how-tos in all of our New Testaments. So how do we do it? I'm going to take these two issues, the heart and the mind, in reverse order. Verse 2 says, we have a decision to make. We sing that song, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. We probably ought not to sing that song unless we've made that decision. Jesus, of course, is our role model. He decided. Isaiah chapter 50, Therefore I have set my face as flint to go to Jerusalem. He knew what he was going to do. He knew that there would be a garden of Gethsemane where the full forces of hell would come against him. Father, if there's any way this cup can pass from me. And the father three times said no. He didn't back off because he was facing something difficult. Verse 2 says, we have a decision to make. And as I'm fond of saying, it's a once forever or once for always decision. It doesn't change when you give your heart to Jesus Christ. You make the decision, you now own me. I'm not my own, I'm bought with the price, Paul writes to the Corinthians. We've got to make the decision. We have no right to do what we want. We have no right to our own opinions if in fact those opinions conflict with the opinions of God. We have to agree with him. And that's a decision that has to be made. We do that by setting our minds on pleasing Jesus. Now that may sound very simple. But it's a decision that you make once and then you reinforce when your heart begins to interfere. It's a decision you make once and then you reconfirm that decision when your heart begins to interfere. Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. You know why he did it? Because he decided once and forever that you were worth it. It's an amazing thing to me. I know when I got saved I wasn't worth anything. I'm not worth a bunch more now. But Jesus decided that I was worth it. And nothing was going to change his mind. No one was going to change his mind. He agonized over the decision. But it was a decision that was already made. There was no escape route. His mind wanted only to please his father. He said, I only do what I see my father do. I only say what I hear my father say. That's an unbelievable statement. Because what that means for you and for me practically is that Jesus, who was God, Philippians chapter 2, says he divested himself of his deity. He didn't lose it. He emptied himself. And he chose not to be equal with God as he walked on this earth. And what that means is that our Lord and Savior, for 30 plus years, never did anything on his own volition. He never offered an opinion. He intervened only when instructed to by the Father. That's what a once for always decision is. Now, this is such an important decision for each one of us to make. And we struggle so much, it's hard to believe that it's that simple and that practical. We think it can't be that easy. Maybe we think that because he's God, he could do it, but we can't. Well, then let me give you another alternative, the Apostle Paul. I'm going to Jerusalem, even though I know that trials and hardships await me. Everywhere he went, people would say, these bad things are going to happen. Don't go, don't go. And he said, stop it, you're breaking my heart. I'm willing not only to go to Jerusalem, but to die if that's what the Lord wills. He made his mind, a mere man made up his mind because his mind had been set. Now, I want to spend the rest of our time tonight just dealing with as practical examples as I possibly can of the issues that we've got to deal with regarding the decision, the partnership between heart and mind. Everyday issues, these are the examples I'm going to use. Now, there are plenty of others. I'm sure the Lord will speak to you about your own decision-making. 
But let's just take these one at a time and you can apply them in your own life. Let me talk first to single women. If you are here tonight and decide right now that you are never, never, never going to get involved with an unbelieving man, you're going to save yourself a lot of pain. Now, as soon as you make that decision, there's going to be Mr. Hot Rich Guy come along <laughs> and your heart is going to swoon and the devil's going to be there. Maybe you can save him. But you see, if you've made the decision right now, and by the way, we try to drum this into your kids from the time they're little. Make a decision now. You're not going to do the things that the rest of the world does because you know those things don't please the Lord. If you will make that decision now, it means you won't even entertain the possibility of getting into an emotional entanglement with somebody who doesn't love Jesus as much as you do. Now, a lot of people think that's asking too much. Moms and dads, your child, male or female, starts to date in school. An unbeliever. What are you going to do? What are you going to say? No, 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 no. He doesn't love Jesus or she doesn't love Jesus. But we're going to make that decision. And even though the world will say that's silly, that's narrow-minded, we've got to make that decision. And if that decision is irreversible, never to be revisited, you'll never get your heart broken in an unequally yoked relationship. I know you've heard this many, many times, but I cannot adequately express the amount of pain that Paul and I and Ken and May deal with in counseling because of unequally yoked relationships. And when your heart is going flutter, 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 you think it's going to be different. It never is. It never is. Men, whether you're married or single, if you decide right now tonight that you're never going to look with lust at a woman that you're not married to. Now, I'm a big fan of looking at lust with your wives and at your wives. <coughs> Holy lust is a good thing. But you need, like Job, to make a covenant with your eyes. I'm never going to look at a woman with lust. Now, we are humans. We look. But the problem is we look. <laughs> Instead of just saying, Lord, you make some nice stuff and going on. <laughs> we look and we linger. And our minds get engaged. And then there's this battle between what we know is right and what we want to do. If you'll make that promise, if you'll make that decision tonight, and remember, it's all here. If you make that decision... When something comes on the television or something comes on your computer screen that violates that decision you made, you will turn the channel or you will turn your computer off and you'll set your mind on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Now, we don't do that because, well, that's so impractical. I've had actually men who struggled with pornography say, well, well, you know, I can't in the middle of the night open my Bible. Well, why not? You're looking at a computer screen. You can. The thing is, you don't want to at that moment. Your flesh wants what it wants, and that's why our hearts are so undependable. You'll never find yourself in a situation where temptation is stronger than you are if you will make that decision and then when the temptation comes, when your heart gets involved, all you have to do is reinforce the decision that you've already made. All of us can decide tonight that God's Word is going to be an essential part of your lives. You've got to make that decision. If you wait till you feel like reading, or if you wait till you feel like praying, it's not going to get done. And so you can make the decision, a once for always decision, you can discipline yourself to make sure that God's word 
is a necessary part of your life. So you can decide to exercise the discipline necessary to set aside time daily for you and the Lord in your Bible. If you don't do that, if you don't make that decision, it'll always be the thing that you push away. One other, I hope, practical tip is that if you'll decide that while you have your Bible, you're not going to have your phone with you. Or while you're praying, your phone's not going to be sitting there with you. Then you're focusing on things above, not things down here, as the Living Bible translates. Husbands, you can decide tonight. Dads, you can decide tonight that your family is going to spend time in Bible study. You're going to do it together as a family. Maybe you're a new believer and you think, my teenagers are never going to go for it. Remember, they live at your house. You pay their bills. You're probably paying their phone bills. You pay for the food they eat. We're going to study the Bible and have family time. You don't have to turn into a preacher and you don't have to, to, to make it long, drawn-out messages. But just sit down and read and talk about what you're reading with your families. Men, you ought to be doing that with your wives on a regular basis, nearly everyday basis. Nothing is every day because life happens. But, but this has got to be something that's important to you. And because it's important to God, then you've got to make that decision. You know, I've been playing this one string guitar for so many years that one of the benefits of being consistent with this message is that people are coming back to me regularly and saying, Pastor Ron, I never would have believed that oh, my husband and my wife or, or, or our marriage or our family could be so in unity. But it's all happened since we've been in the Word together. You may not understand how it's going to happen and it may not make any practical sins to you, but you see, that's the power of the Holy Spirit working through His Holy Word. And if we don't believe that, if we don't give it a chance, then we're the ones who are missing out. I promise you, nothing is healthier for your marriages than a husband and a wife reading the Word together. It doesn't take hours. It just takes a little bit of effort. And you need to make that decision now. And then you'll treasure that time and you won't let other things interfere with that time that you've already reserved to be in the Word with your wife and then at another time with your families. I always think morning is the best time. I'm a morning person. But there's nothing quite like starting the day as a family in the Word of God together. You can make that decision tonight. Had Jesus not decided long before he entered the Garden of Gethsemane, he wouldn't have been able to withstand that full-scale assault of the devil. Physically, we know he was near death. That's what happens when you're, you're, you're sweating great drops of blood. It's your body's last effort to hydrate itself. So physically wrecked was Jesus that it required an angel to come and minister to him. You have to make that decision. All of this, my point is simple. If you decide today that you hate sin and that you love Jesus, that's what is meant here by setting your minds on things above and your heart. And that's when your heart and your mind start to form this partnership and once that happens, you're like an invincible and impenetrable believer. And the enemy has no chance. He'll still huff and puff. He'll still lie and he'll still threaten. But you've decided. And the power of God is with you. Your mind will overrule the things your heart and your flesh want. Now this is one of the places where most of us struggle. We don't see the need to make these once and for all decisions. Not just about the stuff that I'm talking about, but 
about much of anything. We like options. We like the freedom to do one thing today and next week we feel like something else. We'll have the freedom to do that. We don't have that kind of freedom. Now certainly we're free to choose not to do what God wants us to do. But we're not free to escape the consequences of those decisions. Let me give you just a couple of more examples. As Christians, we promise God, we promise God that we'll love our spouses until death was part, or I always like to say until Jesus comes for us. We make that decision, don't we? Now, when our hearts are all flutter, flutter, it makes sense to us. But it doesn't take long when we begin to throw out the divorce word. Because we like to give ourselves options. Well, I'm not happy. This isn't what I thought it would be. Well, well Jesus is in heaven. He's saying, well, what about the choice that you made to love one another until death do you part? We made a vow, an oath. We should have made that once forever decision before we ever made that vow. And the only thing that we prove when we start talking about divorce is that we really didn't mean it. We said it because our friends were there. There was a pastor standing there. But Jesus wants us to mean what we say and say what we mean. The minute we start talking about divorce or separation, we're headed to divorce court looking for numbers of lawyers. And we forget the promise that we made to the Lord. And by the time somebody comes to me or to Pastor Ken and starts talking about this, we tell them, look, you, you, you can't do that. God doesn't want you to do that. Now, there are legitimate reasons for divorce. You all know what they are. We teach the Bible here. But you being unhappy is not one of them. We need to remember always the promise that we made. So what we do instead is we start looking for other Christians and we ask them what they think. And we'll keep asking for those opinions until we get one that agrees with what we want to do. What about the decision once forever made? I can promise you this, I would not be here if a young, immature Christian woman didn't decide, simply because God's word said it, to hate divorce. The Lord spoke to Paul's heart. If you say you love me, you've got to love what I love, and you've got to hate what I hate, and I hate divorce. And she got that. I think the thing that tripped her up was when God says, I love Ron, so you've got to love him. But you see, that's where our mind can steal our hearts and stay on the path that Jesus has set out. Paul had decided that pleasing God was better even than what she thought would make her happier. And I could use a million other examples, but I want to get as practical as we can. Again, God will speak to your lives. If drinking has been a problem in your life, you can decide right now that you're not going to have another drink. It doesn't matter that you want one. Remember, that's the heart. The mind says, no, no, I've already made that decision. You can decide not to go down the beer aisle at HEB. You can decide not to accept an invitation to a house where they're going to offer you alcohol. You can go to a restaurant and you can approach your server before you ever sit down at the table and say, uh, we won't be having any alcohol, so please don't offer any. You can do all of that simply because you made a decision that you're not going to do it. Let the decision you make take hold. I talked about pornography a little earlier. If that's a problem for you, Avoid it. 
No matter what you have to do. You say, well, I can't avoid it. It's on my phone. Get rid of your phone. What good is it if a man gains the whole world but forfeits his own soul? You have to separate yourself from the things that tempt you, the things that try to get you to revisit the decision that you've made. If you have to have a computer, put it in the middle of the room where everybody can see it, what you're doing. Ask for somebody to look over your shoulder if that's what you need to do. Whatever you have to do, Jesus said, if your eye offends you, gouge it out. Now, he didn't mean that literally, but what he's saying is that's how forcefully we need to deal with sin. I've had a lot of people ask me about smoking, so let me talk about smoking. Smoking is not a sin. It doesn't say it is in the Bible. I always like to add it's a filthy, disgusting habit. But it isn't a sin. But I know a lot of you because you've told me God has spoken to you about smoking. Maybe it's cigarettes. Maybe it's pot. God has spoken to your heart. By the way, smoking pot is always sin. You may say, well, I've got a medical prescription. That's just somebody else's permission to get high. You have to make a decision that you want to please God more than you want to please yourself. If you're craving a cigarette and you know God has told you not to do it, Run to Jesus instead of running to the convenience store. Don't ask anybody else for a cigarette or a pack of cigarettes. Just say, no, I've already decided I'm not going to do that. Now, I know a lot of people especially struggle with cigarettes. I've had people delivered instantly from heroin who couldn't quit cigarettes. That's why we need this partnership between heart and mind, because then the power of the Holy Spirit will be the power doing the work. That's where we have to set our hearts and minds on things above, where Jesus is seated at the power hand of God. These are the keys to spiritual victory in your life. We've got to get to the place where we understand that we can't resist sin on our own. And the reason we can't do it is because we don't want to. Remember, in this chapter, God is going to ask you to get rid of some things in your life, and he's going to ask you to put on or add other things to your life. And you can't do that on your own. We cannot resist sin or temptation in our own strength because we don't have any. And when you understand that, that's not a defeatist attitude. That's not low self-esteem. That's simply your track record and mine. What did Joseph do when he was tempted by Potiphar's wife? He ran the other direction. He didn't run the other direction because he was strong. He ran the other direction because he knew he was weak and he needed to get away from the scene. That's who we need to be. That's what we need to do. We cannot resist sin and temptation in our own strength because we don't want to. Jesus provides the desire. He also provides the power. And that power, as I said, lives in each and every one of us. That's why our mind has to lead the way. If you're a born-again Christian, you have the mind of Christ. All you have to do is exercise it. You've got to be steadfast. You've got to be firm. You can't... Make one decision one day and then rethink that decision the next day. Let your decisions be informed by the Word of God. Let your decisions be empowered by the Spirit of God. And if you'll do that, then you're in that place where literally you can say to people, the things of this world are no longer attractive to me. And even in those moments when your flesh is weak and you think, well, maybe that would be nice, Say, no, Jesus, you've been so faithful. You've been so faithful that I don't want to do this. That's also what Joseph said. How can I do this thing and sin against God, he said. Not against Potiphar. Not against Potiphar's wife. How can I do this thing and sin against God? 
Finally, let me close with this tonight. In order to reinforce the decision that you made, I want to be like Jesus. I want to be with Jesus. I want the mind of Jesus. In order to reinforce that decision, you've got to realize the seriousness of our rebellion against God. We can't be nice with sin. We can't sort of treat it like our old casual friend that's not really a big deal. Anything not of faith is sin, Romans 14, 23 says. And those are the things that we've got to decide to run away from. Now, when we sin, John is going to tell us in 1 John that we have an advocate. And if we confess our sins, he, the advocate, is faithful and just to forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. There's an answer when we mess up. But I think the point of Colossians chapter 3 is that God wants to teach us that when we mess up, let it not because be because we haven't made a decision to follow Jesus. One of the things I know about the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives is this. Everything that you've decided to do, when you fail, he'll be right there and saying, oops, let's do this again. Let's decide. That's how serious it is when David sinned. We know what he was talking about, the sin with Bathsheba, the murder of one of his mighty men, Uriah. Just trying to cover up his sin. When the Holy Spirit pierced his heart through the prophet Nathan, David was undone. He hated what he'd done. And that's why Psalm 51 begins with, Against thee and thee only have I sinned, O God. I think too many of us, we are focused more on the people that we've sinned against rather than Jesus. When we choose to sin willfully, when we don't make these decisions, when we want to keep our options open, we're saying to Jesus, I love you, but not that much. And our decisions need to be driven by love. That's where the heart comes back into play. That's when that partnership between heart and mind is reinforced. I resolve over and over, Lord, I don't want to do these things. I don't want to be that man or I don't want to be that woman anymore. I don't want to keep failing. And all you have to do is decide not to. And we can reinforce our hearts with a decision that says, Jesus, I'm yours, I'm all yours, I'm only yours. And it really is as simple as making a decision. I think tonight it's a wonderful partnership to nurture your heart and your mind together. When one is strong and the other is not, the strength will win. But believe me, when you're strong in mind and heart, there's no power on earth that can prevail against you and the plan that God has for you. That's what God wants for each and every one of us. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart's affection on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds the place of decision on things above. As the Living Bible says, not on the things down here, your mind will help you look up instead of looking out. And once you've made that decision, I promise you, there's wonderful freedom. 
And if the devil's whispering in your ear right now that you know you're going to blow it anyway, well, that's why we have an advocate. And all he wants is to forgive you and start over. And you can do that tonight when the men and women from the pastor's class come up and don't be afraid to tell these people. You don't have to tell them any details. You don't have to tell them what you've done, but you can say, look, I, I've been sinning. I made decisions. I broke my promises to God. Maybe you're the husband or the wife that's throwing around the divorce word and you've forgotten all about the promise to God that you've already made. Tonight, you can decide once forever that this is the decision that I purpose in my heart. I've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. Father, as we close our study tonight, 